Uh, I'm very touched, uh, very touched because, um, well, for one thing, um, growing up, I had this very specific notion of what heroism really meant. In our society, then and now, the word heroic is, if you allow me, has been cheapened. It's been overused. It can apply to everyone and everything and a whole variety of circumstances. But I think it has a far more specific and enduring meaning. So yes, I, at a younger age, did not aspire to be here. I aspired to be on a sports field or maybe one day in the Olympics, another Greek contribution to the world. And yes, I admired many cultural and entertainment figures. And yes, I admired many business entrepreneurs. But for me, those weren't the heroes. The heroes were reserved for a very few people who had combined Saros, the right word, courage, and uh, who combined Pivotima, as we heard last night, the, the sense of honor and dignity, and um, who combined Simbonia, empathy, empathy for fellow human beings and were willing to put their lives on the line in defense of those three Greek and universal values. So my universe of heroes was focused on people like Jan Karski and Rowell Wallenberg in the Second World War and the unnamed, the unsung, the unheralded who risked their lives in defense of freedom and human beings and people of other faiths and religions. My world of courage was reserved for Andrei Sakharov and Elena Bonner and Natan Sharansky. My world of heroes was reserved for the Nelson Mandelas and the Rosa Parks and the Martin Luther Kings. Those were my heroes. So for me to be associated in any way, shape, or form, and this is not in the spirit of the Washington art form of feigned or contrived humility to be in any way associated with the name of Metro Metropolitan Chrysostomos is profoundly humbling and frankly deeply challenging because it elevates the conversation to a whole new level of responsibility. I cannot say, and I'm not sure how many of us could say, that were we in the shoes of Metropolitan Chrysostomos on Zakynthos Island in 1943, with the Nazis having occupied not just Greece, but most of continental Europe, that I would have had remotely the courage that he and the mayor showed when the occupying Nazis demanded the list of the 275 Jews and instead were presented, as you saw in the film, with a list of two names, the bishops and the mayors. So I can't say that I'm truly worthy of this award because I can't say in all honesty before you today that I could have stood in those shoes and done the exact same thing. I don't know. Needless to say, I would like to think I could. And I suspect you would like to think you could as well. But the question will always hang for me. But it does mean that for me, the Metropolitan and the Mayor and the other Fortini 306 plus 2, uh, what we call in Hebrew Hasidei Umot Ha'olam, the righteous among the nations, those who at risk to their own lives save Jews, they are for me the true heroes. They are those who demonstrate sados, courage. They are my moral exemplars. And in that sense, this award is an inspiration to me and to AJC, and I hope to all of us who are present today in the Shoes Fortini of you, the first recipient, and Elie Wiesel, the second, to understand that there's always something else we can do, something more we can do in a world that is still deeply broken 
and profoundly in need of repair. Tom caught me by surprise because I somehow had expected he would look at the printed resumes uh, and the printed material and draw from that, and um, he blindsided me. But he's absolutely right, by the way, and he, 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 he nailed it. Um, I wouldn't be here but for the three people he named. It's very simple. You know, we, we look in the wrong places for the secrets to other people's lifetime trajectories. I'm not here because of the high school or college or graduate school I went to. I'm here because of the three people that Tom Miller named. I'm here for a very simple reason. Three good people, three decent people um, were treated very badly. My mother, a refugee twice, first from communism, she was born in the Soviet Union, and then from Nazism. My father, a refugee, first from Germany and then from Austria. Until the Austrians uh, welcomed the arriving Nazis in what was called the Anschluss, my father was on the cutting edge of research in, in physiochemistry, for which he was in 1975, 37 years later, awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Vienna for his study of the synthesis of the heavy hydrogen atom. But once the Nazis arrived in Vienna, that young man who could one day have been a Nobel Prize winner in physics, instead, as Tom said, was deemed suitable for one thing only, to shine the boots of the Nazi officers in Vienna. He was able to leave Austria, and that was only the beginning of his long-time saga. But why? Why? Why could such a process of demonization and dehumanization and delegitimization have occurred? A slippery slope that ultimately led to the destruction of one-third of the Jewish people and one and one-half million Jewish children. For what reason? I couldn't quite ever understand why bad things would happen to good people. And then I met my wife, and I have to say parenthetically, and Tom, this you probably didn't know, had it not been for Greece, I would never have met my wonderful wife. I was working in Rome, Italy, with refugees coming from the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe with what turned out to be the cousin, the first cousin of my wife, who went on vacation to Kefalonia, the, film, the, the island made famous by the wonderful movie Captain Morelli's Mandolin, by the way, if you haven't seen it. And when this young woman, Hedva, who my children know well, came back, she showed pictures of Kefalonia, and one of the pictures was of a beautiful girl in a bikini coming out of the water onto the beach on this beautiful island. And I said to my colleague, who is this beautiful young woman, and is she single or married? That beautiful young woman is my wife today. Had she not gone to Kefalonia, had my colleague in Rome not shown me the photographs of that trip, had I not been so superficial as to first look at the <laughs> bikini, <laughs> you, Daniel Harris, and you, Michael Harris, and you, Josh Harris, might not be here today. But even more, what I learned from my wife, because as a European Jew, I knew less about the story of the Jews of North Africa, that my wife was one of the forgotten Jewish refugees that other side of the Israeli-Arab conflict that no one wants to discuss, no one wants to hear about. The seven, eight, nine hundred thousand Jews who lived for centuries, indeed, in the case of my wife's family, predated by centuries the invasion and occupation of North Africa by Arabs. Yet by 1967, in the middle of the Six-Day War, the last Jews of Libya were either killed or like my wife and her seven siblings, forced into hiding. Three weeks later, they were given safe passage to leave and found refuge in Italy. There's one little vignette from that story. My wife and her family were saved by a Muslim, who to this day, 46 years later, refuses to allow himself to be identified 
He's still alive. He remains petrified that if his name is revealed, he will be the target of violence and potentially death for the sin of having saved the family of ten Jews. My wife, her seven siblings, and her parents. So we will not for some time have an award called the Metropolitan Christosomus Award for that individual, though we should. But when his society changes enough to recognize that what he did in saving other human beings is worthy of respect and recognition and not of fear and intimidation, then we know we will have turned a corner. So finally, I want to say that much of my life has been devoted to trying to ensure that what happened to my mother, my father, and my wife never again happens to anyone of any faith or creed or nationality or other distinguishing feature. And AJC became my platform, together with my colleagues, for trying to fight for those values. And I believe in fighting for those values, I'm fighting for core Jewish and Greek values. Because Winston Churchill was not right about everything, but he was right about many things. And he was certainly on point in identifying Athens and Jerusalem as the wellspring of the core foundational values of our democratic civilization, and there is no better civilization yet established. So from the very beginning, the names of Homer and Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Euclid and Pythagoras and Euripides and Aristophanes and I can go on and on and on and on, were core to my foundation, to my education, to my understanding of the world, every bit as much as what I learned as a Jew about my own Jewish heritage. And I always believed that the two were intertwined. And I always said that if I had the chance one day to publicly affirm what unites us as Greeks and Jews, as Hellenes and Jews, as Greeks and Israelis, as Greeks and Americans, I would say so proudly. And this occasion gives me that opportunity to say that I believe in fighting for these values. Greece and we stand on the same side of history. And let me tell you, because my moral filter, though I was born after the war, has always been the Second World War. If Charles de Gaulle if Stalin, if Zhukov, if Roosevelt, if Hitler, if Mussolini, and if others could all agree on one thing, and they didn't agree on much else, it was that Greece fought heroically, indeed defined heroism in the Second World War, and that the war's outcome might have been different. The victory delayed had it not been for the example set by Greece and its partisans, not to mention the personal example of Archbishop Damaskinos and Metropolitan Hirsosomos. And so I say, I say, ochi to anti-Semitism and xenophobia. I say, ochi to racism and discrimination. I say, ochi to persecution. And I say, nay, yes, to a world built on mutual respect. I say nay to a world built on mutual understanding. I say nay to a world built on foundational democratic values. I say nay to a world built in respect for human freedom and human dignity. And so I accept this word humbly and uh, happily by asking you to continue to stand with us together in defining that world which began thousands of years ago in Jerusalem and in Athens, and that to this day remains the world in which we aspire to live, Epharistopoli.